this. A couple of you guys uh, actually answered properly about what the controversial thing is in Romans, and we're going to get to it. So, all right, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you that uh, we could come together uh, once a week and study your word and um, fellowship, get together, and uh, just um, enjoy each other's time, Lord. I just pray that we can all focus and receive your word, that uh, it would make sense to us, that it would be easy to understand, and that it would be hidden in our heart, Lord. Uh, as your word says, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Um, that's the hope, Lord, is that you just expand our knowledge and our understanding um, through these studies. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Okay, cool. So um, we, we left off with verse 17 last week, and we're actually going to cover a little bit of that. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the verses with you guys first, and then we're going to go in and talk about them, okay? So starting at verse 18, here's what it says. It says, but God shows his wrath from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since he's made it for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his external power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols making, made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the Creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. Since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. And let them do the things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises. They're heartless. They have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, and yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage them. They encourage others to do them too. Okay, so this is going to be a heavy one. We're going to kind of we're going to jump into this a little bit. It's going to be a little bit different format than I'm than I'm used to. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit better about not reading everything directly off of here, so that I can be more interactive with y'all as as I'm teaching. So we're going to start with uh, verse 18. It says. For the anger of God or for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Okay, so if you remember the very last verse that we read in uh, last week, it says what? I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation. All right, so Paul, he, he, he's starting this train of thought. Like, so if you were writing a diary, okay, and you, or you were writing a letter to somebody and you wanted to um, start discussing a, another topic, something that's different from what you've already been talking about, you would kind of like head that off and then begin talking about the thing. So we're going to kind of look at that last verse. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's, it is the power of God for salvation. Okay. And then he goes into this. Okay. So it's, it's good to remember you, the Bible, and I know a lot of people believe this, and it's a very stupid thing to believe, but the Bible is not to be read one verse at a time and be like, well, that's my life verse, okay? That's taking it out of context, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to take things out of context. We want to understand 
why the thing was written, who wrote it, who he wrote it to, what does it mean, what is he addressing, okay? Because sometimes there's things that are written in the Bible that don't actually apply to today. There are some references that are made, because I, I don't know if any of you guys are of the Jewish uh, upbringing, a nationality, but there are a lot of things that we as non-Jewish people would probably not well understand, because this is written to people who were... Jewish, and then Jesus being a Jew, and then leading into the new church. So that's, again, why Paul is writing Romans, is to try to make those connections for the people that wouldn't have understood Jewish history and tradition, okay? So he's not ashamed of the gospel, and then it goes into verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, okay? So Paul starts this thought by saying he's not ashamed of the gospel. Then he's talking about the wrath of God, and it's revealed. Revealed means seen or acknowledged, right? Like, um, you guys, have you guys seen videos of gender reveal parties? Okay? You're revealing the gender of the thing. Okay? So God's, the, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So because of all the ungodliness and all the unrighteousness of human beings, God had to reveal himself from heaven. Okay, and the, the practical application of that is we, we can't save ourselves, we need God to save us. So because we can't save ourselves, God reveals himself, and his wrath is also revealed. Okay, so we as Christians, we, we see his salvation, and we embrace that, and we say, I want that, I acknowledge that, that's for me. Okay, but then God's salvation is only one aspect of God's character. God also, he's just, he's kind, he's merciful, right? But he's also full of wrath. God is full of wrath. And that's a hard, a lot of churches don't like to talk about that because it seems negative. It seems angry. God is full of wrath. So the Bible even says that he's storing up wrath for the day of judgment. So there's a lot that even we as the world, when we live in darkness and, and the sin uh, and all that stuff exists around us, God's patient with us. He doesn't destroy us like we probably all deserve the second we sin, he doesn't just strike us down. I mean, it'd be really easy to know like who's not been sinning, right? Because only the people alive have been sinning, okay? But we see that God's wrath is also revealed and it comes from heaven and it's against the ungodly and the unrighteous. So to suppress something, because here's an interesting thing it says in the, the end of the verse. It says, God's wrath is revealed, but it's who's it revealed to? The people who's who by their own unrighteousness, their own evil, they suppress the truth, okay? So what does it mean to suppress something? Well, to suppress something means to um, purposefully ignore it, suppress it, right? And say that there's some information about you that you don't want the public to know, okay? Your job would be to suppress that information from getting revealed, okay? So you're pushing it down. It's kind of like, oh, it doesn't exist. It didn't really happen. Uh, so the people who are suppressing the truth, God's wrath is revealed, and it's because of them that God's wrath is revealed. Um, so think of some ways that people ignore having to be held accountable for their actions, right? How many of you have talked to somebody about your faith, about Jesus, about being a Christian, and people are just like, I, I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe. Or I have a hard time believing. I have a hard time understanding that. Okay, I may be a little bit um, radical in my thought, but I think that people who refuse to acknowledge God do it so that they don't have to be held accountable for their actions, right? It's easy to suppress the truth of God if I want to live in sin and I want to do whatever I want to do. It's really easy for me to be like, mm, God, not right now. I really feel like I want to be with this person right now. Or, no, God, not right now. I know what your word says. This guy or this gal that I like, I really want to be with them. Or, God, I know what your word says, but I'm just going to go get drunk. I know what your word says, God, but I'm just going to do these things, okay? They suppress the truth by their wickedness, but as we continue to read, you're going to see God is well aware of that. He's, he knows it's going to happen. He, he Actually, Paul is prophesying, essentially, that this is the result of how people will be when they suppress the truth. So God's wrath is revealed because people know the truth and purposefully ignore it. So then verse 19, it says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, 
to the people that suppress the truth, it says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Paul is making the argument that every single person, no matter how much they're trying to suppress the truth, every person on earth acknowledges that there is a good and there is an evil. You don't have to be a Christian to look out in the world and be like, there are some evil things happening out in the world. Okay, you, The problem with relative truth is that we have 19 people, 21 with Rachel and I included, we could have 19 different versions of truth in this if we subscribed to relative truth. Okay, But relative truth may get you so far, but absolute truth is what's going to get you. This is, this is God's, God's revelation in the Bible is absolute truth. That's how we, when we put on those lenses of our Christian worldview, things make more sense to us because God reveals it to us. So uh, an example, and I've used this before, of absolute truth is the law of gravity. If I drop this Bible, it's going to fall on the ground. There's not a scenario in the world without interruption, of course. Somebody could catch it. You know, Somebody could like dive up here to grab it or whatever. But without interruption, the absolute truth is that this Bible, when I let go of it, is going to fall. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what. When I let go of this, if it stays floating... We're going to form an orderly line, and we're going to leave this room, and we're going to go because <laughs> the place is haunted. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so absolute truth says it's going to fall. It fell, okay? Now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much I want to argue against this falling. The absolute truth is it will fall, okay? So, again, when people want to ignore accountability and suppress the truth, they, they're doing it, but they already know what is true. And this is what Paul is saying here. He's saying it's plain to them. What can be known about God is plain to them because he's shown it to them. God, in another passage of scripture, the Bible says that nature itself declares the glory of God. So if you, let's just, let's have a thought experiment for a second. If you, um, let's say you were born uh, and you have the ability, the mental capacity of a 15-year-old, but you've never talked to any person. You've never talked to another person in your life, and you were just, you were not given any information. No one's there to help you. They, you're born, you're 15 years old in this weird scenario. You walk outside the hospital, and you look around, okay, without any influence, without anybody saying anything to you. I think that you could easily walk out there and be like, wow. This place has been created. This is amazing. And then as you continue to learn how things work, I think scientifically you can continue to see that, that things were actually very intrinsically, very specifically created. And let me, so let me give you an example of, of um, what I think the argument Paul is making here. If you guys were out taking a hike in the woods and you found a cell phone laying on the stump of a tree, okay, and it was just sitting there. There's no one around for miles. You're like deep in the woods, okay? Do you think that you would think to yourself, wow, look at what nature did over millions and millions of years. It's created this cell phone, and it's in the root of a tree. That's amazing, right? No, we would obviously be like somebody lost their cell phone, okay? Someone else created the cell phone. Someone owned it. They had it, and they dropped it and it fell out into the woods. It wasn't created, okay? So the fact is, and this, is, this goes into like a logical type of argument or a philosophical argument, is like everything has a starting point. Everything in creation has a starting point. We can date stuff with carbon. We can know that when something was made, right? With the exception of God, of course. But we know that everything has a starting point, and there is nothing that has been uniquely created that hasn't already been naturally created by God. Everything that we do in our society mimics something that God has done. Even our painting, we don't paint things that don't exist. We paint abstractions of those, but they're still real things. We paint beautiful sceneries of what God has already created. Okay, We don't paint things that don't exist. When that happens, maybe we can have a conversation about it. Go ahead. 
So I'm just talking about like us as a creative person, right? When we are painting something, no one like, okay, so God being the ultimate artist, Good point. But a unicorn is based off of what? That already exists. A horse with a horn, right? There's animals already with horns. The, the point, okay, guys, you're nuancing the, this to death. That's not the point of what I'm trying to say. The point I'm trying to say is that creation itself declares God's glory. We can look out into creation and see that God has created something. That this is, at least at a minimum, and most people that aren't Christian would say, well, sure, I believe in a God. I believe in some sort of intelligent designer. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to assign a name to him, but sure, surely I can see that this world did not just show up one day, just pop out of thin air, and all of a sudden we're here, okay? And it didn't, it, it, and it didn't evolve over millions of years because we would see, I mean, we wouldn't still have certain animals that have evolved, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of getting off the off track here for a little bit. So um, in verse 19, it says, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them, okay? For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature have been, made, have been clearly perceived. So let's think about this, like his eternal power and divine nature. So do humans control the weather? We, we're trying to, right? I'm sure we're trying to. I know that they do like cloud seeding where they can put, you know, moisture in the air to try to get it to rain in places where it's not supposed to, or it doesn't normally rain. Okay, but what about earthquakes? Do humans control earthquakes? We can, we can get a little bit of a warning before an earthquake happens, right? A little rumbling. Uh, what about tornadoes? Do humans control tornadoes? No, but we get a little bit of a warning before they happen. We can see the patterns forming, okay? But those are still far outside of our control. And no one is going to go look and be like, oh, well, somebody clearly is up there controlling that tornado and making it happen, right? Like that would be a little bit crazy, unless, of course, they're talking about God. So um, what about the sea? Can humans control the sea? Can we control tsunamis from happening? No. So since the beginning of time, that's what Paul's talking about, the eternal glory and God's divine nature. Since the beginning of time, these things have always existed. They've always been a sign that something is going on in the world that is far outside of my control. Someone is in control of these things, and it's not me. You guys, uh, any of you guys watch Young Sheldon? Yeah? So you guys, I think it's in one of the very first scenes of the show where he's sitting outside and he's looking at the stars. And he says, Mom, why don't you believe in God? And then she gives him some sort of an answer. And she's like, why are you asking me that? And he's like, do you know that if just... 1 or 0.01% of our gravity was different, the, everything on earth would smash in and would, would combine. And if it, was, if it was different in the opposite direction, everything would float away and fall apart. And he's making the point, which most people would make, is that if the conditions of where we live were just slightly different, none of us would be alive. It's that intricate. Our oxygen levels, the way that atoms combine and collide with each other. It's all very specific. And it's not, the point I'm making and the point I think Paul is making is it's not accidental. The world didn't just, we didn't just take a bunch of dice, roll it out and be like, okay, that's the perfect, we're just going to go with that one. Like it was very carefully planned. We need a certain amount of oxygen to live. We need water to live. We need food to live. All of these things are outside of our control, right? And it points to there being an intelligent designer. Even, um, the things made with scientific advancements. So think about this too. With scientific advancements, we have been able to see even more detail how carefully God made everything. So for example, they've been recently studying the human eye and they're, they're coming to find out that there are so many factors about the human eye and how it works that if just one of them is off, you lose complete eyesight, right? And it's so... So the idea is that for this to have evolved over time to where we have what we know is the human eye right now, it would have been decades and decades, if not millions of years of people with no eyesight, that it just suddenly finally evolved into our ability to see. Okay, verse 21, it says, for although they knew God, talking about those people that he's turned them over to, 
uh, that are suppressing the truth. They did not honor him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their thinking, which means empty or foolish, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So again, Paul, what he's saying is they have no excuse because they know God. Everyone knows that there is something outside of themselves. They choose instead not to honor him. And because of that, because they don't honor God, God allows their hearts to grow darker and darker and darker. Okay? There are two things that happen when you are confronted with the truth. You either draw closer to it or you push it further away. And this is why in the book of Hebrews, the author says this. It is impossible for those, this is Hebrews 4, 6. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who, and who have fallen away, it's impossible to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying Jesus all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and in danger of being cursed. So there is real physical danger to rejecting the truth. Now look, God is not going to force any of you guys to, to serve and believe in him, okay? God isn't going to come in here and he's not going to say, make a choice right now or go, okay? He's going to allow you to make mistakes. He's going to allow you to uh, make certain life decisions that he knows are not going to be good for you, okay? For those that God loves, the Bible says that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. That doesn't mean that all good things happen. It just means that everything happens to those, everything that happens to us who love Jesus, God is doing something in that. It's for our good, even though it doesn't feel good. Okay? So there is a real danger in rejecting the truth because the more that you do it, the further and further away you are going to go from God. And so then in, in back to verse 21, where it says uh, they worship the things... They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. This is Paul basically saying they've created statues and idols to worship. And we see this in the book of Genesis when Israel is freed from Egypt and they're, they're making their way and God is going to give Moses the Ten Commandments on the mountain. Moses goes up. He's gone for an indeterminate amount of time. He comes back and what are the people doing? They're worshiping a golden cow. They're, they're, they're around this cow saying, this cow brought us out of Egypt. This cow rescued us. Even after all of that, all of that God had done, releasing them, setting them free, having a, a fire by night in the sky to guide their way and pillars of smoke during the day, all of that, and yet they still went to go worship a golden cow. We are so, that's not unique to Israel, guys. That's us. That's human beings, okay? We could be in church praising and worshiping God, and the second we get home, it's like, I, I got to get back in making money. I got to get back into my relationships. I got to do all the, we idolize things all the time. We, we're, we're prone to make idols over and over again. We can worship our families. We can worship our relationships. We can worship our friends. We can worship politics. We can worship the condition of the world around us. There's so many things, money, all of that. These are all created things that people choose to worship instead of God. It's like, duh, dummy, God is there. You don't have to worship these things. God is the giver of all things. Okay. So then verse 24, it says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator. So he gave them up. Listen, this is this God is not being passive here. This is another hard teaching. A lot of people don't want to talk about what the Bible says here, but it's not passive. God actively gives people up that reject the truth. So I don't know what the limit is. I don't want to find out what the limit is, 
But I certainly don't want God to give me over to my own self because I make bad decisions, guys. At 44 years old, I still make bad decisions. I still do things that I shouldn't do. I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to be the one calling the shots in my life. But this is what it says in verse 24. He gave them up to the lust of their heart. They were already so hardened, he gave them over. He said, you know what? That's fine. If you want to reject the truth and you don't want to uh, live the way that I say is best to live and acknowledge that what I say, I happen to be the creator of all things. I think I know how it works. You want to reject that? That's fine. There you go. That's your reward. And they will live that way in absolute misery with possibly the worst scenarios of their People that lie don't make a lot of friends, guys. People that constantly lie, they don't have the best friend groups, okay? People that, um, people that cheat on their spouses, they don't make really good spouses, okay? People that uh, uh, take advantage of people that, are, that can't take care of themselves, um, they, those aren't good people. Okay, so they don't make good friends. And so the, the point that Paul is trying to really make here is if you want to continue down the path of rejecting God and ignoring it, that's fine. But there may come a day where you can't see God anymore because he's fully given you over to your own desires. And that is going to be your reward. See, no, nobody that doesn't want to spend their life on earth with Jesus is going to want to spend an eternity in heaven with him. Okay, that would, be, that would be awful. That would be like hell to them because they don't want it here on earth and they reject him and they reject the truth of who he is. So why would they even care and want to go to heaven? So God gives them over. I mean, this is crazy to me that he gives them over to their own desires. Because they've denied God and worshiped everything except him, he hands them over to their sin. This is the result of continually denying the creator. He lets us have what we want. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Now, this is a little bit different than the version that I read out of, but uh, it still says the same thing. It says, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. What is that talking about? Sorry. Okay, how dare you Sorry. call me gay? No, I'm just, yes, it is. It's talking about homosexuality. Now listen, you guys are going to, you guys are going to meet people in your life that are going to be convinced that Love is love, and God doesn't care about your sexual preference, okay? Let me explain to you why he does actually care. And it goes straight. Now, if, here's the thing. If you don't care about Jesus, you go do whatever you want, okay? It, it doesn't, it makes no sense for me to try to tell somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, hey, you shouldn't do these things because God doesn't like those things, right? Okay? It doesn't make sense to say to somebody, hey, don't, don't, um, don't cheat on your spouse. I mean, you, I should say that. I should say don't cheat on your spouse, but what difference does it make if they don't have the gospel? If they have no reason to have a moral standard, what, why, why care, right? Um, actually, I have a, a, a little thought experiment for you here about nature. Rach, um, will you do me a huge favor? Here, hang on one second. I, I meant to do this in advance, but I forgot. Will you go get me two water bottles? Mm -hmm. have water bottles. Water out on each of them. Bring them mm -hmm. up. Okay. okay. All right. All right. We got it. Okay. I got a little, uh, a little example I'm going to use. Okay. So you're going to, you guys are going to meet people. Okay. That are going to be convinced that God doesn't care about homosexuality. Okay. And they're going to make really good arguments for you too. Some of them are very smart. There's, there's a few out there that have devoted their whole lives to, uh, trying to draw out of the Bible, any type of loophole that could exist right? But the honest ones, the ones that, I, that are pro-homosexual uh, evangelists, most of them will tell you that it's, it's not in the Bible. I just don't care. I'm going to do what I want anyway, okay? But listen to what it says here. It says, for this reason, he, this, again, God giving them up 
And then it says, for women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. What does it mean by nature? Yes, but a little bit more. Give me, in relation to God, what does it mean by nature, particularly where it's saying this? Thank you. People of the world? Mm. Okay, when, when the Bible uses the word nature, it's, it's talking about things that come naturally because God made it that way, okay? For example, no matter how much surgery you get, a, a man is not able to give birth to a child because a man does not have a womb, okay? So a biological man is unable to scientifically to give birth to a child. It is not natural for that to happen. It is natural for a woman who has a womb to give birth, okay? So when we're referring to nature and natural, we're talking about God-intended design, okay? So when it says that they give up, they gave up natural relations, God intended the relations for those that are contrary. Contrary means opposite or against. Okay? It's against nature, contrary to nature. Okay? So when someone wants to come up to you and be like, dude, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about homosexuality. It does, actually. You have to act you actually have to remove the words of Paul from Scripture to maybe make a decent argument. But then you would be re removing like 75% of the New Testament by doing so, okay? So again, nature, and I know, look, I, I understand that this is a hard topic. I understand that there may be people in here that have differences of opinions on it, okay? Um, I'm telling you what I believe to be the absolute truth in scripture, okay? So your opinions on those things, if that's what you're, you want your opinion to be, that's fine. But don't pretend to follow what Scripture says, okay? Don't pretend to be a Christian if you aren't going to take all of what the Bible says. So it says the natural thing. So then for this reason, meaning that they continually reject God and they deny that he is righteous and that he is the creator who should be acknowledged in worship. So God gives them over to their passions, and many of those passions are contrary to nature. Men and women gave up natural relations with each other. So there is a natural relation, because Paul wouldn't refer to natural relations if there wasn't a natural relation. And the natural relation we know is found in Genesis. When God looks at Adam and he says, it's not good for man to be alone, and he gives him a wife, somebody to come alongside and to help him. Again, it's not a power dynamic. It's not the man is better and the woman is better. It's that the man isn't complete until the woman comes along. Okay? It's not a power shift. It's not man is just better or women is just better. Okay? It wasn't good for man to be alone, so God brought him a helper. And that helper is someone to come alongside. And the prime example of that is my wife and my relationship. We've been married for 23 years, and I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do as a husband or a, as a man, if I didn't have my helper. That's right. So, so one more thing. Okay, well, I didn't do that for cheers. All right, guys, we're getting divorced. Never mind, just leave it alone. All right. So we know in Genesis... We know in Genesis that God has a natural order. But look at what it says about it says about men. It says men are consumed with passion for one another. Is there any way to say that and it not be sexual? Men consumed with passion for one another. Is there any way that that could just be besties? Have you ever been passionate for your bestie? Jackson. Okay. Well, we already we already know. Well, this is for you, Isaiah. This whole passage is for you then. Um, but, I mean, again, you have to really do a lot of, you got to do a lot of mental work to try to make this mean something that it doesn't actually mean. Okay? The acts that these people commit shamelessly, uh, which means that there is no guilt or conviction against it. These people are doing what is unnatural and they're calling it natural. And there's no guilt or shame anymore because, because why? God has given them over. He gave them over. 
They don't feel conviction. That's the scariest thing. If you're a Christian and you sin and you don't feel conviction over it, that's the scariest place to be. And that's what these people are doing now. I'm not saying that they were once Christian, but I'm saying that they have now given themselves, God has given them over to the darkness. Now, I understand that love is love, and I, 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 uh, I know that that's a big argument that people will make. They'll say, love is love. Why should we try to stop love from happening? Why should we, uh, why should we interrupt and tell people who they can love and what they can love? Well, first of all, um, we do that with kids. We say, hey, you're an adult. You can't love that kid. That's not your child, right? That's weird. Okay. We also say, hey, uh, you're a human being. You are not allowed to love that animal Okay, because that's also not good. And not only is it not good, but it's also not healthy. Okay, And very similarly, that's what we as Christians are saying when we talk about homosexuality. Let me be very clear. I, if your attitude towards a homosexual person is hatred, you've already failed. Okay, I want to be really clear on that. Make sure everybody's tracking. If your attitude towards homosexuals is hatred, you failed the test. Okay, That's not what I'm saying here. You can very easily love and have compassion for a person and not give approval to their sin. Okay. However, there are boundaries that you have to, to draw. There are lines that you have to draw. If your friend, you can have a friend that's a homosexual, but when they invite you to go out to the bar, to the gay bar, you say, no, I'm good, thank you. Right? Or, or it doesn't even have to be about homosexuality. It could be with anything. All right. I can't tell you how many times as a Christian that I've been very clear to, with people that I don't look at pornography. I, I struggled with that before in my life. So when a group of guys who aren't Christian, they get around, and they have a phone and they're sharing a video or an image of something that I know that I would not want to look at. Okay. I can say, no, I, I can still be your friend. Don't show me that image. I'm not interested. Okay. You can stand on business without having to give up your own I did. I did. So I need a volunteer, not Isaiah. What? Please, please, please. I'm going to first one. Please, please, please. Please, please. No. 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 I raised my hand first. I raised my hand first. I raised my hand first. Get out. Get off the skates. The skates? I raised my hand first. All right, sit down. Blaine, come up here. Okay, good. All right, so I have two bottles of water. I, I had Rachel go do something for me. All right, so, well, hang on. I'm going to give you an option. All right. One of these bottles, Rachel went into the bathroom and filled it with toilet water. Okay, I'm not going to tell you which one. One of them only has a little bit of water poured out, and it's regular water. Okay. So here's what I want. Okay, listen. Pay attention. Would you like to drink no. one of these? Why not? I'll drink one of well, them. Shut up. <laughs> Just give me an honest answer. Why wouldn't you want to drink one? It's okay. There's no bad answer. Uh, I don't want diseases. Okay, you don't want diseases. Thank you. Okay, so here's, here is the exit. No, you sit down. So you can sit down now. You're good. Yeah, no, they're both open. I'm not touching. Yeah, you can, you can sit down. I, I, you're good. Thank you. Okay, you so drinking? I'm not. Okay, so water is water, right? Water is water. So love is love, right? If, if love is love, then water is water, and there's no difference between drinking out of the toilet or drinking the pure water. Does that make sense? Okay. So love is love. Water is water. Which one is, came from the toilet and do you want to drink it? So. Are you? Oh. We're done with the one more. Well, you think you're Hold on. You think you're I think this was the toilet one. <clears throat> It wasn't toilet water, guys. But I did swallow really wrong. <laughs> and it was so cold that it's like shocking my heart right now. Holy cow. I know. 
<laughs> Whoa, not having a heart attack. All right. Okay. So, again, I think this made sense, right? Love is love. Water is water. Don't drink toilet water. But, but really, look, from a, from a medical perspective, there is actually a lot that you can get from having homosexual sex. Whether it's with a guy and a guy or a girl and a girl, there are tons of, there's a, like a list of diseases that are easily to get. On top of it, here, actually, you guys want to know a crazy little fact that I noticed recently? Uh, when was the last time y'all were in Walmart? Say within the last week or two. Okay. When you're walking down, if you're in the pharmaceutical aisle where there's like makeup and stuff, but there's also like toothbrushes and toothpaste, uh, here's what I want you to pay attention to because this is what I've noticed. There has been an increase in the stocking of adult diapers. And they're starting to use, pay attention, listen, 10 years ago, if you were to buy a package of adult diapers, you would see a person that looked like grandma or grandpa on the package. They were marketing to those people. The reason that there is an increase in sales of adult diapers is that there is an increase in homosexual sex. And God has not, they have to because they can't hold their feces in, brother. After you have had, if you've had enough homosexual sex, you're, this is not going to be able to stay contracted. And, and see, and we want to talk about nature. I know this is gross, guys. I get it. I understand, but this is the truth. We're talking about natural things, okay? The reason, the reason it's unnatural, or one of, the, one of the effects of it being unnatural is that little muscle does not stay tight forever. The, the man-on-man muscle. That's why they're wearing adult diapers. Go ahead, Mariah. Please explain it to her. But listen, next time that you're in Walmart, go look and see what the adult diaper section looks like. Just walk by it. It's right there in the pharmaceuticals. And notice who they're marketing to. Young men and women now. They're marketing to it. So there's been an increase because homosexuality has become an acceptable part of society now. Okay? So we're talking about the natural versus the unnatural. It's very clearly unnatural because if it were natural, you wouldn't need adult diapers to live the rest of your life. Okay? If it were natural, you wouldn't need adult diapers for the rest of your life. Okay? Okay. I'm going to have to send an email out to all the parents tonight. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Tell me afterwards. Okay. Well... Hey, look, it's unadulterated truth, man. I don't know what to tell you. If you don't like it, then you probably need to find a place that's a little bit simpler. You know? <laughs> All right, so verse 28. We're almost done. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, what does he do? He gave them up. It's another word. He gave them over, and he gives them up. He gave them up to a debased mind. And I think, I'm not a historian, but I'd be willing to bet that if you were to do a deep dive study into Rome right before it fell, what you would find is that sexual ambiguity became popular and homosexuality became the norm. And then Rome fell. Okay, And I, I do believe that that is statistically accurate, like historically accurate. And so if you were to take those facts and you were to look at our country, and see, I'm 44. I was raised before homosexuality was legal for marriage. There were people in pockets here and there that, that you, like, you knew that they were gay, but like, it was not, they weren't on television. In fact, Ellen DeGeneres was the very first gay person to be on television to come out. Ellen? Yeah. So, and that happened in the late, uh, or the early 90s. That happened. So, the world has shifted quickly, and I believe that just like in Rome, I believe that a sign that God is judging a nation, whether it's America or somewhere, somewhere else, a sign of God's judgment is an increase of sexual immorality. Whether it's sleeping around outside of marriage, or it's cheating, or it's homosexual, there's an increase of that, and that is a sign of God's judgment. Because he gives them over to a debased mind. So the result is they have no remorse, no feeling, no morals, no cares. They'll do what they want. And God says, that's your reward. That's why we're not of this world, guys. 
The Bible says we're not of this world. We are from a kingdom that is otherworldly. Okay? We, we are, when we are saved, we are brought into that kingdom. It says we're adopted as children into God's family. That's why we don't fit in in the world. And it's okay to not fit in. Honestly, I don't, like, I was watching a video uh, of, a, of a mom talking about why she didn't want to send her kids to school. And her friend was being like, well, don't you want your kids to be normal? She's like, no, I don't want them to be normal. Normal sucks. Normal is out there, guys. Normal is void of happiness. It's void of purpose. It's void of, of joy. It's void of peace. How many people in your life that aren't Christian, can you, can, who can think of at least one person in their life that isn't a believer that is absolutely miserable? Could be a friend, could be a family member, just somebody you know. Who can think of more than one person? Keep your hands up. Who can think of more than two people? Dude, the world is, the world is miserable, guys. It's okay to be weird. It's okay to not fit in. It's okay to do you and be that way with Jesus. Like, stop trying to conform. Like, this, there's nothing out there for you guys. I promise you. I promise you. If you think that I might be wrong, I've lived a life and I've experienced a lot of the world. I promise you, being with Jesus is the best thing that I've ever done. And I've been to foreign countries. I've met famous people. I've, I've drank with famous people. I've had a lot in my life that I can brag about and say that I've had great things happen. Nothing in my life has been fulfilling until I met Jesus. And nothing can compare to it. Even the momentary like bursts of, of oh, I'm going to do that thing because you know that's what my flesh wants to do, it doesn't fulfill. It doesn't satisfy anymore. You know, getting angry at somebody and yelling at them, losing my temper, it doesn't satisfy. None, none of that does. Finally, the last two, ver uh, last two verses here. Uh, or 29, it says, they were filled. So this is what happens when God gives them over. Okay, this is the result. We've talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of those things. That's what a Christian produces. Okay, every tree produces fruit, Right. You're either going to be a good tree or a bad tree. You're going to produce bad fruit or good fruit, but you're still a tree that produces fruit. So this is what happens when people, when God gives you over, this is the result. Now you tell me if you see this happening in your life. You don't have to yell out, but just think about it. I'm going to list off a bunch of things. If you see this happening in people around you, then you tell me if you think that there's a problem. Okay? He gave them over. In verse 29, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness evil, covetousness, so jealousy. Have you guys seen jealousy in your life from other people? Yes. Okay. How about malice, hatred? Have you seen hatred from yes. other people? Okay. They are full of envy. So that's another kind of word for covetous. Envy is more like I want to be like that person. Covetousness is like I want to have the things that they have. Okay. So how many people have seen envy? People rising in envy. Okay. How about murder? I see killing all the time on TV. And not just, I'm not talking about TV shows. I'm talking about like crime constantly happening. People are getting killed. People are getting shot, right? Strife, arguing. You see a lot of arguing, okay? Deceit, lying, a lot of liars, okay? How about gossips? Oh boy, we don't want to talk about gossip, do we? Guys, let me be very clear. Gossip is the very same thing in the eyes of God as murdering. I'm going to say it again. Gossiping, talking about somebody behind their back, is the very same thing as murder in the eyes of God. Okay? The church doesn't talk about that enough. It truly doesn't. Gossip is sin as much as murder is sin. Okay. Slanderers. You know what that means? When you say something untrue about somebody to try to slander their name. You guys seen that? I've seen it. Yes. Slanderers. Yes. Haters of God. I've seen a lot of haters of God. Okay. Haughty and boastful. Ego, pride, a lot of that. You guys seen a lot of that? I see a lot of that. Inventors of evil. Isn't that a weird term? inventors of evil. So the evil that they already do, it's not even enough to satisfy, so they have to invent new ways to be evil. That's crazy. That is insane. Disobedient to parents. Oh, whoa. 
That's thrown in there? That's crazy. Disobedient to parents. Now listen, let me be very clear. Not every parent is going to tell you something that is good for you to do. Okay? I know that there are parents out there that don't have some of their kids' best interests in heart. Okay? There is a difference between being disobedient when you know it's the right thing to do and being disobedient when you just want to be disobedient. Okay? There are times, there may, be, there may be a parent in here, one of you guys that says, I want you to deny God. Why do you say that? Then it would be okay to be disobedient to your parent. That's not what the scripture is talking about here. It's talking about not honoring those who have come before you, not giving them the honor that, that is due to them. God gave you your parents, guys, good, good or bad or worse. God gave them to you, just like God gave me my children, for good or bad or worse. Sometimes I usually lean on the worst part, but um, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. It's starting to sound like a Kanye song. Why are you going to be so heartless? Um, okay, verse 32, and then we're done. I know I went long today, guys, sorry. Uh, Though they know God's righteous decree... So though they know what is right, this is what it's saying. All of these people, this whole list of all these sins, though they know what is right, though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. Okay? The payment, there is a payment for sin, it is death. So they know, and they know that the people who practice these things deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. So not only committing sin, but approving of others who practice sin. I'm going to present, I just want to present you to think about that, like to really drive that point home, to, to give approval to those who practice them. What happens every June? What happens if you don't celebrate Pride Month? All of those things. All of those things. A sign of God's judgment is all of these and homosexuality being roped into that. Okay? And then another sign is when we're, this is where I think we're at as a nation, those that are not only okay with sinning themselves, but they approve of others sinning. And that's what I see when people demand that you teach ge gender ideology to people. And then you also demand that they use those pronouns or that they use those different terms, right? It's not just, they're not just okay with other people sinning. They want you to sin too, guys. They do. And they want you to approve of their sin. And this is a result, this, this was written 2,000 years ago. I didn't just write this on my way here. I didn't look at the world and be like, all right, let me pick out a few things and mention them and be like, yeah, God's talking. This was written 2,000 years ago. And we're seeing it played out in real time, real life. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Uh, Lord, I just want to pray for, uh, I just want to, Lord, I want to pray that you reconcile people that have broken apart. Lord, I, I pray, God, that you would, whatever you have to do in the minds and the hearts of us that ha have a relationship that was once good and has been severed and broken, Lord, I pray that you help restore that for us. For me, Lord, it's my, it's my mom. It's my relationship with my mom that has been broken. It's been broken for many years, God, and I pray that you would reconcile that, that you would bring my mom and I back together on even ground. And Lord, I pray that same prayer for those of us in here who have friends or family members or loved ones that they've broken apart from. Lord, I pray that you would bring in reconciliation, Lord, that you would actually, um, that you would impress upon us how to forgive even when the hurt is so bad against us, that you would help us to learn to forgive, Lord, because your, your word tells us that if we hold those things in, it's not going to be good for us. Holding grudges is not biblical, it's not righteous, and it's not good. 
And Lord, I pray that you help us to walk through and work through forgiveness for others, for parents, friends, siblings, whatever it may be. Help us to reconcile and restore those relationships, Lord. And I pray for the people in here that don't know you, Lord. I know that I can't save them, and I know that no logic or reason can save anybody. So I pray, God, that you would just reveal yourself to them, that you would, I don't know if it's going to be now or if it's at home before bed or if it's just walking on the road uh, after school one day, Lord, but I just pray that you just reveal yourself to those that don't know you and don't believe in you, that they would see that you are good, Lord, that they would see that I'm just not a crazy person up here trying to get people to come to church, but I actually really want to see people happy and at peace, knowing their creator and knowing that they have a good heavenly father that provides and takes care of and nurtures and teaches. Lord, I pray for healing. Anybody that's struggling with pain in their body, I pray for healing for them, Lord, that you would just bless them. That you would give them some relief and comfort for that. And I pray for sadness, Lord. I pray against sadness. I pray for those that are feeling sad and hopeless and feeling depressed, feeling like the, the world is really big and it's too overwhelming and it's hard to deal with. Lord, I pray that you would just give them a sense of purpose, that you would comfort them and take them in your arms and hold them and say, look, I got you. I know it's not good now, but it gets better and it will be better. I know that God wants us to trust him. So if you don't trust Jesus, I pray that you would trust Jesus today. And if you don't know how to do it, if, if, there's, if you feel like you're, you're called to, uh, God is tugging on your heart and you finally are like, I'm going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit my life to Christ. There's no, there's no magical thing to say. It's just simply saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. You saved me. You died on the cross for me. And I believe you. And I'm going to give my life to you. That's it. And that's not even, it's not even a magical phrase. But I pray, Lord, I pray, God, that you would just use this time to bring about some change. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these friends of mine, Lord. Thank you that you've given me the opportunity to teach them and to talk to them about you and answer questions or whatever else that you may have, Lord. I just pray that uh, I pray that we're all doing the right thing and we're all where we need to be. And I just pray that you would speak to us and give us wisdom and discernment on what decisions to make next. Some of us are going to be going to college soon in the next year. Some of us are going to be going in a couple years, and we're already thinking about what the future is going to look like and where we're going to be and what we're going to do. We're trying to make parents proud. Lord, I just pray that you speak wisdom to us and tell us what you want us to do and make it clear what we're supposed to do. I thank you, Lord, for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, any Q&A questions before we uh, grow? I really went long, guys. I'm sorry. I intended not to go this long today.